Today's topic is forecasting, forecasting basics, and we're going to review three very simple forecasting techniques. I'm going to have four videos that provide examples where, where I show you specific examples on paper here. The first one will be the simple ones. The second one will be on exponential smoothing, which is a slightly more advanced and kind of a modified weighted moving average. Uh, the third one will be what's called the multiplicative seasonal model, which is a way of uh, incorporating seasonality into your forecast. Seasonality is regular changes in expectations uh, based on seasons, weeks, time of day, time of year, all of those sorts of things. Uh, and the last one will be looking at forecast error, uh, which is a way that we uh, evaluate different forecasting approaches and uh, and take a look at uh, which one is performing best in our individual circumstance. And in fact, uh, the best choice is usually circumstance specific, and I'll talk about that a little bit. I just wanted to spend a minute talking about the importance of forecasting in uh, any, uh, for any business student, uh, you know, we often teach forecasting in operations, but, but it uh, applies in marketing, it applies in sales, it applies in production, it applies uh, in HR, it applies everywhere. And, and at some point in your career, you're going to have to do forecasting and being good at forecasting makes a difference. Uh, before my uh, career as an academic, I spent some time in industry. I was a product manager. Uh, when I was promoted to marketing manager, I thought, well, I must really be a good marketer. Uh, but in fact, my boss said, uh, while I was a good marketer, I was really being promoted because I was a very good forecaster. And that was a way I was making the company a lot of money. And he wanted me to sort of bring my approach to forecasting to the entire marketing team. So. It is something that is worth knowing and is worth doing well. Uh, these four example videos will complement uh, sort of the PowerPoint videos that I will upload separately uh, that introduce sort of the concepts uh, around forecasting and our important background material. So let's begin now with the, with the forecasting basics. Uh, and we're going to look at three approaches, naive forecasts, moving average forecasts, and weighted moving average forecasts. And really this is sort of a natural progression through these basics. The naive forecast really just takes the previous period, in this case were weeks, it could be months, it could be day, it could be whatever time period, the periodicity doesn't matter takes the previous one and uses it at the forecast for the next one. Uh, I'll just highlight here that, you know, usually we're forecasting into the future and, and we don't, you know, this is kind of unique to studying forecasts, but being sure that we uh, know which period we are forecasting and which numbers we are forecasting uh, which numbers we're using to form that forecast becomes critical. Again, that's not really an issue in real life, but it can be an issue here, and so we'll pay particular uh, attention to it. So the naive forecast, we don't have uh, time period zero, so we can't do a forecast for period one because we don't have the previous period. What you'll see is often people just use, uh, the, you know, move it over. So for, for this, for the naive forecast, we use period one sales of 20 to forecast period two. We would have done that when we didn't know what actual was. Uh, and then similarly, 22, 18, 21, and 22. So it really is a relatively simple approach, just uses the previous period. If we look at a moving average, a moving average just then sort of expands that to not just taking the previous period, but taking a number of previous periods. And so in this case, because we have a small data set, we're going to do a two week moving average. And so uh, we can't then forecast one or two. And this is often where students go wrong. They'll take the average of 20 and 22 and use it as the forecast for period two, 
which you can't do because you, you're trying to forecast what this is going to be. You can't use the number to forecast the number. Uh, but again, that is unique to studying uh, forecasting because we can't usually, uh, we don't usually have that number when we're forecasting. So let's look then. If we're taking a, doing a forecast for period three, we will take the average of 20 and 22, the sales for period one and period two. Uh, and so for period three, that will be 21. Then we move up. This is a moving average. We take the average of 22 and 18, which is 20, 18 and 21, which is 19.5 and 21 and 22, which is 21.5. So really we can do different lengths of moving averages and, and we will often look at different lengths of moving averages and there are different benefits to different lengths of moving averages. So let's just put this aside for a moment and talk about moving averages. So moving averages shorter are more responsive. So if you have a trend or if you're moving in a particular direction, the shorter moving average keeps up with that better. Uh, and so it's good for uh, change, uh, for, for sales that are changing, going up, going down. Uh, then, and then the longer are more stable. So they don't, if you have an outlier, a, a, a particular week that is a big outlier, a, a longer moving average does not respond as much to that. Whereas if you have a shorter moving average, if you have a real outlier due to a snowstorm or some aberration in demand, that shorter moving average might, uh, uh, might pull you in one direction or the other uh, in a way that's not warranted. Now you may just choose to take that outlier out of your series, but uh, the shorter and longer uh, give you the ability to, uh, to, to look at both approaches. Now, the downside of a longer one is it, it, if there's a change, it takes longer to respond to that change. So let me give you a quick example. I'm going to draw a, a, a quick graph here, and and the number the, the the lines aren't going to be perfect representations. These are stylized, but uh, but they're just to sort of give you a, a sense. So I'm going to go up, and I'm going to go up, and then I'm going to go down, and I'm going to go down, up, 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 down. Okay, and then I'm going to go pull that line. A. And then I'm going to have line B, which comes uh, up, up, down, up, 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 down, up, down. Again, these are stylized. They are not intended to be perfect representations. And then I have, that's, we'll call that one B, and I'll have line C, which goes something like that. So I, I often use a graph like this on, uh, and in fact, this isn't accurate, uh, uh, but Again, it's stylized. I'll often use a graph like this with actual numbers on an exam just to get people to be sure that they understand the differences between different lengths of moving averages. So if I ask which one is the actual, which is the two week moving average and which is the six week moving average, the first thing I would look at is the flattest line, line C, is less responsive to any of the others. So I would say that the six week moving average is line C because it is the flattest line. So what it does is it takes 
all of those bumps that may be random out and just sort of give you a steady number. The line A is the one with the extreme points. And with the extreme points, that can never be an average because always the average will be inside of those extreme points. So line A is the actual extreme points. And then you can see line B is the two week moving average because it is more responsive. So just a just a, an illustration there of how uh, moving averages uh, look a bit uh, look in, in the context of a problem like this. I'm going to give you one more quick example here and show you. Say my sales are trending up. If I had a short moving average it would respond but it would always be a little bit behind because it's always looking back here. So you can see the, the moving average when you have a trend can fall behind. If I have a longer moving average I will have a flatter line but I will fall further behind because I'm still using numbers from further back. So you can see the relative merits of, of the different approaches to, uh, uh, to, to moving averages. The last uh, one I wanted to do here is the weighted moving average and the weighted moving average just weights the uh, weights the recent sales differently depending on uh, usually weights more recent sales more highly so uh, in this case I'm going to do a weighted moving average where I give a weight of 3 to most recent and a weight of 2 to second most recent. And so in this circumstance if I go back to my original data again because I'm doing two week weighted moving average I have to start a forecast for week 3 is equal to 3 which is the weight times 22 which is the sales from period 2 Remember, sales from period two plus two times the sales from period one divided by five, so that is the sum of the weights. And that is equal to 21.2. Sometimes you will get these uh, uh, weights as a proportion. And so you would get weight 1 is equal to 3 divided by 5 is equal to 0 0.6 and weight 2 is equal to 2 divided by 5 which is equal to 0 0.4. Weights need to sum to 1 and then you don't have to do the division. So th th it just becomes an easier way to do it. So similarly then forecast for week 3 is going to equal to 0 0.6 times 22 plus 0 0.4 times 20 is equal to 21.2 and for week 4 is equal to uh, 0 0.6 times 18 plus 2 times 22 equals 19.6. So if I go back and put that into my original data here, oops, wrong one, that's my notes. 
put that into my data here, weighted two week moving average. I had start at week three, I have 21.2, I have 19.6, I have 19.8, and 21.6. So all this does is it says, uh, in period two, we had 22. In period one, we had 20. We think this one is more important. So in fact, we end up slightly higher than the moving average. Then in week three, we went down to 18. We think 18 is more important than 22 because we have some recency bias. And so we get down to 19.6, which is lower. So it just responds more quickly than the two week moving average to those changes. So again, there's sometimes example when you have a trend in one direction that you would uh, that you would want to reflect uh, a weighted moving average and reflect the most recent ones more. But if you use a weighted moving average and you have a real outlier, then essentially you're putting that outlier, giving that outlier more weight and responding even more significantly to you, to it. So. Uh, this was an example of a two-week moving average. Like with the simple moving average, uh, you can have much longer. You can have three, four, five. You can have ten if you wanted, as long as your weights sum to one. So that's a quick introduction, forecasting basics. Um, make sure you take a look at the exponential smoothing, the multiplicative seasonal model, and the forecasting error ones uh, also uh, to, to get the full picture.